hunting dogs, man's best friend on the couch or in the field. Each breed has its own characteristics, how it searches out game, how it behaves, and how it fits into a family as a household pet. Now just what are the differences? The best comparison can be made by someone who handles different breeds. Warren Cahoon from Bourbon Barrel Hunt Club trains a lot of them. He'll give us some insights into choosing a breed. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Freckles is an enthusiastic, tail-wagging Springer Spaniel, a breed of dog that used to be more popular in the 40s and 50s as a pet and as a hunting dog, but it's still a good, solid breed for upland game. Now, Springer's got their name from their hunting behavior. They don't point game. They flush birds from cover. Springer's use their noses to scent game birds on the ground. Oh, they have excellent noses. And they use their noses to close in on the birds, but they don't have the instinct to freeze on point. Freckles has a peculiar habit of circling a bird she smells, tightening the circle closer and closer. She's trying to pinpoint the bird's exact location. And then the flush. Hold that bird. Hold that bird. The birds we're working with here are hunting preserve birds at the Bourbon Barrel Hunt Club near Imlay City. The birds are quail, chucker partridge, and pheasant. And Freckles shows that Springers do well at retrieving game, too. In contrast to the Springer Spaniel with its long hair and flushing instinct is the German short-haired pointer, another breed that was actually more popular a few years back than it is now. Now, it's a great house dog. It's a good hunter. But too much breeding for show and for field trial has alienated a lot of hunters who like a solid working dog. The working bloodlines are difficult to find. Except for the bobbed tail that buzzes on an excited short hair, they hold tight on a bird, moving only if the bird moves or the wind changes. Now, we know exactly where this bird is in front of the short hair's nose, but I didn't know it was going to flush in my face. Well, I was too surprised to shoot. The quail got away. Warren Cahoon of the Bourbon Barrel trains all of these dogs, and one of his old favorites is Humphrey, a seasoned Brittany Spaniel who's had many years and many more birds under his belt than most dogs. Like a German short hair, Humphrey points game, but he looks more like a Springer since he is a Spaniel. He has the long hair, floppy ears, and his tail is bobbed. Now, he was just on point right there. The bird moved, and Humphrey lost the strong scent, so he moved on too. Brittany's are small dogs, but when they're in good condition, they cover a lot of territory. You'll see Humphrey lock up on a solid point right here. Rock solid, and I see the bird. No, this is a chucker right here. There's a chucker right in front of me. You see John right there? Yep. That's a chucker partridge, a popular game farm bird. When you spot them close like this, you want to let them fly out a distance before you shoot. I cringe a little bit. Dead on. <laughs> the straightaway shot is an easy one where an open pattern barrel works best. Back with the chucker is Humphrey, showing the retrieving skills of a Brittany. Now, Humphrey doesn't bring the bird directly to the trainer, but retrieving isn't the strong point of this breed. It's the keen nose and pointing skills and the love of hunting that makes the Brittany a breed that's growing in popularity, just like their cousin, the English setter. While Brittany's aren't as large as setters, they do have stamina and they make good house pets as well. But English setters definitely have the class with their flowing tails that wave and dance as they run, their style and flash to English setters that are attractive to a lot of people. This is a young setter named Bones who Warren Cahoon had just started working with. Now, he makes the moves all right, but Warren says these instincts have to be developed. What's a trick to training? I know you can take a dog in a matter of days and turn its behavior around oftentimes, or, you know, really, really bring it into a, a good working dog. Well, what's your secret? We work with a dog. Uh, you as yourself, you, you think you work hard at something with a dog. You, you are, but for 20 minutes, a day maybe, where we go out in an hour, hour and a half on each dog, and you put some time on with them. And you can see where the dog's weaker, and you work on the, the weakest points first. The English setter we put out, Bones, is a relatively young dog, 
relatively inexperienced dog? Yeah, I wouldn't say he probably pointed 20 birds at most in his lifetime, the way he acted when we first came out with him. Mm -hmm. But you, you still, when we had the quail in front of it, you lifted up its tail, you, you actually touched the dog while it was pointing. Right. The, the dog is not that accustomed to, to having to point that. It's bred into them, but until you work the finer part, points out on them, they've done enough of it that it doesn't come naturally sometimes. When Warren gets out both dogs, now the older and more experienced Brittany and the younger English setter, you can see a definite difference, not only in ability, but in social interaction. The Brittany is locked on point, but Bones won't get near him. The young setter sticks near Warren because, well, Bones is a little tired. But Humphrey had just snarled at Bones a few minutes earlier for getting too close and too friendly. <laughs> Bones was intimidated. So Warren reaches down and flushes the pheasant that Humphrey is holding on point. That well, was a long shot, but a good one by Bob Garner. Humphrey finished his job by bringing back the pheasant. A well-trained dog, that's a hunter's best friend in Michigan outdoors. Here's a real trophy, a bluegill that weighed almost a pound and a quarter. It was over 11 and a half inches long, taken on a night crawler by Mark Wood of Saranac in Montcalm County. Jerry Peterson of Wyoming caught this nine-pound walleye in the middle of August, fishing Muskegon Lake with Captain Mark Martin. Richard Miller is holding this freshwater drum or sheep's head he took in the St. Clair River. It weighed eight pounds, three ounces, and he caught it at midnight on a night crawler. Big brown trout and bomber lures come together a lot in the spring near Frankfurt, and it happened to Frankfurt resident Terry Groff, who caught a 17-pound, 10-ounce, or 32 inches long. Eddie Fulton of Belleville has reason to show off this Montmorency County turkey, a 16 and a quarter pounder with a nine inch beard. He took it early in the season. And how's this for a massive Upper Peninsula buck? Donald Lohman of Zeeland got it the second day of the gun season last year in Gogebic County. That's a 10 pointer with a 22 and a half inch spread. Now Donald says he got it stocking and that's a good reason to make Donald Lohman our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Deer Hunter of the Week. National Hunting and Fishing Day is coming up this Saturday. That's the day we set aside to educate non-hunters about the role we hunters play in wildlife management and habitat development. Now all of these efforts are positive, but there's an even more effective way of promoting hunting. See, the number of young small game hunters has decreased over 25% in the last four years. Youngsters don't seem to be quite as nuts about hunting as most of us were when we were kids. Parents will tell you that the reason that fewer kids hunt anymore is that there are too many competing activities like school and social events and even the TV set. But I'd bet that many of those kids don't even get asked to go hunting. So if you really want to celebrate National Hunting and Fishing Day, go ahead and participate in the events this Saturday. But after that, find a kid, your own, a niece, a nephew, or a friend's kid and invite him or her to go hunting. Get them enrolled in a hunter safety class and let them discover the fun of squirrel and rabbit hunting. Pass the tradition along. That's the best way to celebrate National Hunting and Fishing Day and the only way to keep our right to hunt. White-tailed bucks now have their antlers polished, which brings to mind questions from hunters about antlers. Mark Hammond from Coldwater said, the first of January, I saw an eight-point buck I thought that bucks lost their antlers by that time of year. Why did this buck still have his antlers? Well, Mark, after the breeding season, a buck that has bred a lot of does has a big drop in his testosterone hormone levels, which causes the layer of antler cells nearest his skull to granulate and fall apart. That's why their antlers fall off. Now, in young bucks who don't breed much, their antlers stay on sometimes until March, and so do bucks in captivity that don't get the chance to breed. Some bucks even have their antlers until early April. There are always stories behind those big bucks you see in the trophy book, like Mike Bates with his big Upper Peninsula 8-point, Pete Champnoise was featured with four sets of racks from last season, two with a gun, two with a bow, all of them nice trophies. 
Jack Helvelman's 11 point with 11 inch tines. That had to be the thrill of a lifetime. It was the easiest buck he'd ever taken. And leading off with our trophy book tales, let's hear from Ron Arthur from Langsburg, who bagged an 8 point with a 21 and 5 eighths inch spread. It just made the minimum of 28 for a Stroh's Award. The night before opening day, Ron spent a long night of card playing with the boys. Didn't get home very early, and I was sitting in my blind, and I fell asleep, and I woke up, and there he stood, and I shot him, and I was done hunting by 8.30. <laughs> That's so you were, you were asleep before? You went out to your blind so you could get some sleep? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I got out there about quarter after 7. It was good and daylight, and uh, by the time I got there. Now, now, what caused you to wake up? I don't know. I just... Just woke up and it was a doe and him standing there and I shot him and that's all it was. Now, did you finish your nap then or did you? No, I went back and showed off the deer. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> well, congratulations. Yep. Quite a story to go with that one. Ron Arthur, the opening day snoozing buck. Jack Hugh Vellman, Genesee County, an 11 pointer with a 17 and 5 8 inch spread up around Flint area, huh? Yes, sir. Moved in this summer. We'll make a short story even shorter. Shot one opening morning up near Cadillac, came home Tuesday, bought a second license Friday night, slept in Saturday after I got permission to hunt. I went down the road about a quarter mile, did uh, half an hour later, and I'm all done. And you got yourself an 11 point buck with tines. These must be of close to a foot long. Uh, 11 and a quarter. Kidding. Outstanding. Genesee County, Jack Huvelman. Congratulations, his second buck and a dandy. Heat champ noise, hunting Kent County. One of the deer he got was a 175 pounder, a 10 pointer. Pete, you always have a whole bunch of racks. This is last season, huh? Yes. Well, tell me about them. What's the? Which one? Well, the big ones, the small ones. Boy, you, boy, you have an interesting rack right here, right there with that. Uh, sort of deformed? Where, well, what's the story behind that one? Well, uh, both beams were there when I shot it. And uh, by the time I found the deer, and dressed it out, got it in the truck, it was dark. I had to go back the next day to look for the other antler. We got four inches of snow, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> so that's a substitute antler on there? No, it's uh, the antler that broke off is, you can see right oh, here. Oh, I see. Off. I see, so he had an antler, probably Actually, to close to match the other one, huh? Around a 15 or a 16 point. I'll be darned. But I, I lost four points, so. And on these other deer, these are just run-of-the-mill hunting stories? No, been hunting the same area for 22 years. I know where they're at. They can run, but they can't hide. <laughs> Not from Pete Champ noise. Michael Bates, Ontonagon County. This is another Upper Peninsula buck. Say you were stalking this buck? Well, not really. I call this my dessert. Your dessert? My dessert. It was uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we just come in from lunch. And I told my buddy that I was hunting with that I was kind of burnt out in my spot because I hadn't seen a deer all week. And he talked me into going into his area. And about five minutes after I walked away from him, I looked up, and here he was. So you hunted a blind for a week without seeing anything? till Wednesday. Now, how long did it take him to talk you into hunting a different area? Five minutes. <laughs> Boy, that's a lot of perseverance in one spot. So you moved and you got this eight point with a 22 inch spread. Yep. Congratulations, Michael Bates. Boy, I'd, I'd get a little antsy before a week. And if you're getting a little antsy about the upcoming hunting season, would like to learn some last minute helpful hints from the experts so that you might have your day in the spotlight in our trophy book, come to our fall hunting workshop in Okemos near Lansing this weekend. Pete Squibb, the DNR biologist who brought the Sichuan pheasants to Michigan, will take the main stage with a pheasant seminar for 1988. At 1 o'clock, I'll join Danny White from Buck Stop Lure Company, the famous doe in heat people, to get the nitty-gritty on scents. You folks know I'm a skeptic. When bow hunting for birds and small game, should you use broadheads or blunt point arrows? Blunt points are far superior to all other type points for small game hunting, Blunt points will stun the small bird or animal, allowing the hunter to retrieve his game.
Scott Odette from Grand Blanc sent us a recipe for chowder that's a little bit different, isn't it, Kathy Beitler? It is. It's got a lot of your normal ingredients. You've got potatoes and onions, a little bit of white wine, some basil. Curry powder hmm. is a little bit different. Thyme, water, of course, some half and half, and just some heavy whipping cream. And olive oil, he says, to cook the fish in first. And don't fry them. You just want to saute them. Now, what kind of normally chowder we've made with salmon? That's right. Salmon or a trout. This is not salmon. This is going to be um, actually bluegills. You want to crush your garlic. And you put that through a crusher if you want. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way. Just kind of crush it. And you fry this with your onions. In the olive oil. In the olive oil, right. Hmm. There's your little fillets. I'll be there, little pieces of blue. Or you could could use... Uh, just about any kind of white fish. Walleye, just about anything. Mm -hmm. And you just want to stir those around. And just want to lose the color on those. And your potatoes. And then you're going to go ahead and add all your water and cook this like you would a stew or, or a chowder. A little bit of white wine, of course, just for a little bit of taste. You could use lemon juice if you didn't want to use wine. Mm -hmm. And some basil. A handful, huh? Yep, <laughs> just about. You need a tablespoon, a good tablespoon. And thyme, of course. Curry powder. Now, there's just what you taste, just a little bit different. Hmm. And it really does give it a different aroma as it's cooking, too. Well, there's actually a lot of uh, spices and herbs in here. More herbs, right, because I think the fish is so mild that you need something different. And, boy, you can just smell that through the whole house. I wonder, out of all those ingredients, I just wonder which one the Bob Garner is going to pick out. It's going to be hard to tell. You want to thicken this a little bit with the half and half and your whipping cream. And you don't want to cook it, overcook it here because those will scorch. And do need to thicken your soup just a little bit with cornstarch and water. And it thickens very quickly, so you want to keep it stirring at this point. And then we put it to Garner's palate to see what he picks out as his favorite flavor. It's a curry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's I it. Guess that's what it is. That's it. And, you know, and... I mean, this is an this is an election year, and I want to know want you to know right now. I vote for curry. <laughs> I like curry in recipes. <laughs> and I like based on time and, <laughs> and and I vote for this recipe too yeah. because it's a yeah, really it, good recipe. It, is. it doesn't it doesn't taste like any other chowder we've ever had. No, no it's it, because I guess of the curry. Mm -hmm. It's not only it's it's not it's it's a very unique recipe, and also. Boy, you could serve this to, to, to your finest friends, too, because it's a very delicate recipe, excellent tasting. It tastes exotic. It, it does. does. Yep. It does. It's something you'd put on a gourmet menu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, on the other hand, you could serve a lot of it to Bob. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and there won't be many leftovers, either. <laughs> and if you can't get outdoors this weekend, it's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll turn our attention to the upcoming bow and arrow deer season. A quarter of a million hunters will be trying their luck, and I'll try to give them tips for better success. That's next Thursday night, bow hunting right here on PBS. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan